Coming up, truth or fiction, flying on the step is faster, flying across the Pacific on solar power alone. She's in the shop right now, but she could be yours in the future. And oh, to be young, gifted, and flying the dream. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. From your first skyward glance, the dream of flight compelled you. And from your first glimpse of a Cirrus, you realized that dream had a name. Cirrus Aircraft. Go where you've never been before. Well, is there a simple technique that can increase your cruise speed at no cost? Hello everyone and welcome to AOPA Live This Week. I'm Warren Morningstar. Tom Haynes is on assignment. And I'm Melissa Rudinger. Thanks for joining us. Aviation is full of wisdom and techniques handed down through the generations. Ideas of how to fly better that came from long ago that may or may not be true. Oh yeah, that's, you know, that's really true. There, it's like, you know, like running your engine over square or the dangers of uh, turning down wind. And another is the speed advantage. Uh, you can get by flying on the step. So is that a myth? AOPA's Dave Hirschman and Mike Felucci put it to the test. Among pilots, there's few better ways to start an argument than on the step. And oh, that's yeah. the idea that uh, this age-old idea that there's speed and efficiency to be gained by climbing above a target altitude, then descending on the step to get that wing planing more efficiently and go faster for longer. Yeah, I don't know where that came from, Dave. You know, I think that migrated over from the, uh, the boating community. But you don't think there's anything to it? I think it's a myth. Okay, well, you don't, I mean, People, pilots have been doing this for decades. You don't think there's any advantage to be gained whatsoever? I do not. I do not. Now, you know, there, no, there are no loopholes in the laws of physics. All right, well, let's just see. Let's just see. These two Cessna Skyhawks were built the same year, and they're identically equipped. They're being flown side by side at similar weights, and their performance is evenly matched. During climb out, the two stay together at full throttle as they close in on their target altitude of 6,500 feet. When they get there, the lead airplane levels off at wide open power. Okay, coming up on 6,500, I'm gonna level off and uh, just continue the climb. Okay, we'll do that. The wing airplane climbs an additional 200 feet, then descends on the step. There's 67, starting downhill now. Race on. The lead airplane is pulled ahead, but not for long. As the wing airplane descends, it closes the gap. The two airplanes are exactly even in level flight at wide open power, and they stay that way. I'd say it looks like about a wash. I would say so. It looks like uh, our speed matched just about the time I pulled line of breath. So what's the conclusion? There's absolutely nothing to be gained by climbing above your target altitude and then descending on the step. A pilot who does this trades some potential energy in the form of higher altitude for kinetic energy, a momentary increase in speed, but the overall aerodynamic equation is unchanged. So I gotta say, um, I was surprised by the result of our of our flyoff. And I gotta say, I wasn't surprised in the least. <laughs> well, I mean, I, certainly, I thought there would be some difference. I mean, as it turned out, the planes were exactly equal. I mean, right down to within like a foot of one another. You know, I've got to officially proclaim Bravo Sierra on this myth. All right, it is officially relegated to the big book of aviation myths. Thanks, Dave and Mike. Advantage definitely goes to Mike. We'll be looking a lot more at bits of conventional aviation wisdom in future stories. If there's something you'd like us to prove, send us an email at aopalive.aopa.org. Well, Melissa, here's something that's no myth. Flying general aviation in Europe is expensive and difficult but not impossible. The idea of just hopping in the Cub and going, that's sort of out the door. Garrett Fisher shipped his Cub from Alpine, Wyoming to Germany, and there he's continuing his passion of aerial photography. And so what I plan to do is to write a number of books over here. I'm in flying like crazy, taking as many pictures as I can. So the focus will be similar in respects. I'll spend a lot of time in the Alps, the glaciers, uh, the peaks over 14,000 feet. In fact, I actually, before I left, I bought a 
I spent more money for a class one transponder to go above 15,000 feet. And it certainly costs more to fly in Germany. So far at my home airport, which is Egelsbach, it's which is the one of the busiest general aviation airports, I pay seven euros and 98 cents, which is a little over nine dollars per landing fee. That's actually low. I thought that was high. It's a bit low because it's my home field. Um, so far at other airports, I've been paying between 11 and 15 euros. I, uh, there was a surprise one a few days ago was 30 euros, which is about uh, $36. So, um, and as far as Avgas, that was the real surprise, about $10 a gallon. Maintenance can be a challenge as well. It's not a matter of finding just an a &P. You have to find an a &P in Germany that is certified for the model at hand. And then on top of it, the actual repair station has to be certified for the model. So there's a rather large one next door. I walked over and asked, just, hey, can you do some you know, simple check on something? He said, well, we have a guy certified for the PA-11, but we're not, so we can't touch it. Garrett is the latest to join our Opinion Leaders blog on AOPA.org. So the plans are to share the story, the good, bad, ugly, the beautiful, all of it. Um, so some emphasis on costs. I, my point is to make the awareness that these sorts of things can make their way westward across the Atlantic and we don't want that to happen. And you can find all of the bone mows from our experts at blog.aopa.org. And you know, Melissa Garrett says that uh, flying in Europe is definitely worth it. He says it's something you should put on your bucket list. I've flown there once and it, it certainly is, I agree. If owning an aircraft is on your bucket list, how about a really nice Cessna 172? And it could be yours for free. AOPA's next sweepstakes airplane will be a remanufactured 172. AOPA pilot senior editor Jill Tallman shows us the beginnings of November 73 Niner Hotel Whiskey's extreme makeover. She's out of hibernation. This 1978 Cessna 172N has been sitting in a hangar in Westminster, Maryland since 2006. Not anymore. Her owner, Tom Johnson, donated the Skyhawk to AOPA. And while she's not much to look at right now, that's all about to change. 739er Hotel Whiskey is AOPA's next sweepstakes airplane. You know, I've had the airplane 30 years. It's, you know, it's been a very good airplane. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, it's, Time to finish other projects. Tom has a lot of good memories of 739er Hotel Whiskey. Oh, I've done a lot of personal flying. I've personally had this airplane in the Bahamas, down to the Key West, out to Oshkosh many times. I've done a lot of flying with it. But Tom wants to free up a little space in his hangar. So it's time for this trusty Skyhawk to head out to Wichita, Kansas. The team at Yingling Aviation will begin the process of turning this tired Skyhawk into a Yingling Ascend 172. From the inside out, 739er Hotel Whiskey will become as close to a new airplane as you can get. This airplane will have features that didn't even exist when it first rolled out of the Cessna factory. Jill Tallman, AOPA Live. Thanks, Jill. We'll bring you more coverage of the 172 sweepstakes in the coming months. And you can find out all about the sweepstakes at aopa.org slash membership slash sweepstakes. If you're an AOPA member already, you are already entered to win. Well, we couldn't get through a show without an update from Washington, I'm afraid. So, a report from the arcane and confusing world of Congress and FAA budgets. The Senate Appropriations Committee has just reported out a bill that would fund the FAA in fiscal year 2017. A couple of key points in this bill. It prohibits spending money on developing user fees, and the accompanying report says the Appropriations Committee will prohibit funding for any effort to remove air traffic control from the FAA. But appropriations aren't the same thing as authorization. You have to have both. The Senate FAA reauthorization bill that includes the Pilots' Bill of Rights too is still awaiting action in the House. Now, Transportation Committee Chairman Bill Schuster still wants to move forward with his plan to privatize air traffic control. Stay tuned. And coming up after the break, flying the Pacific Ocean at the speed of an old Buick. I literally get to live my dream every single day. And 25 years old and sitting on top of the world, You're watching AOPA Live this week.
Welcome back. You're watching AOPA Live this week. Amelia Earhart flew from Hawaii to California in 18 hours. 81 years later, Bertrand Picard did it in 62 and a half hours. But he did it without burning any fuel. Solar Impulse 2 landed in Mountain View, California on Sunday. The solar-powered, round-the-world trip will continue across the United States. Next stop, appropriately enough, is the Valley of the Sun, Phoenix, Arizona. Well, mo most often our flights end in celebration. Sadly, there are times when they don't. Dr. Jonathan Sackier was about to participate in an NTSB forum on reducing GA accidents when he learned a dear friend had lost his life in an aircraft accident. To change behaviors necessitates changing beliefs. And yes, it can happen to you. It can happen to me. It happened to my friend. I dedicated my talk to my friend and I begged the NTSB faculty and audience to do everything we can to stop any other family going through this torment. You can watch Dr. Sackier's complete flywheel report on AOPALive.org. Scroll down to the Health Channel. A snowy day brought tough competition to the Red Bull Air Race in Spielberg, Austria. In the master class, German pilot Matthias Dolderer in the lead for the series after taking first in the race. Austrian Hannes Ark finished second at Spielberg for third place overall. AOPA ambassador Michael Gullion qualified in eighth place. But a bright spot for the Americans in the Challenger Cup. The Challenger Cup offers young pilots from around the world a chance to get hands-on racing experience. American Kevin Coleman finished in second place. Spielberg was only his second race, but it was also his second trip to the podium. He placed second in the Abu Dhabi race. You know, racing and aerobatics are definitely in Kevin Coleman's blood. Now, we talked with the young pilot at Sun and Fun. I'm in uh, my rookie season. It's 2016 for Red Bull Air Race. I'm 25 years old, so I'm the youngest, and I'm also the only American in the Challenger Cup. What's awesome about the Challenger Cup is Red Bull supplies the airplane, right? So we don't have that pressure. We don't have to have an airplane there. We don't have to maintain the airplane. Red Bull Air Race takes care of all that for us. They have three extra 330 LXs, so all the planes are the same. There's no advantage. You get there, you draw what plane you have, it's all good. All the planes are set up exactly the same, so it comes down to pilot skill, right? There's no advantage of one of the airplanes. I flew air shows from the time I was, before I was born, until I was seven, then my older brother flew air shows. Uh, so I've been going to air shows before I was born, actually. My mom was pregnant with me and I was at an air show. Marion Cole uh, taught my dad how to fly aerobatics, taught my brother how to fly, taught me how to fly. He was at the hospital the day I was born. He was at all of my birthdays. He taught me how to fly, how to fly aerobatics, and I definitely wouldn't be here without his help. Well, Michael goulian has been helping me since I was literally 13 years old. Um, so it was awesome to be able to lean on him. And even before getting to Abu Dhabi, of course, you know, he was helping me like prepare mentally and like this is what we got to do. So once we got to Abu Dhabi and I got in the plane, you know, Michael's right there coaching me the whole time. So we were able to learn a lot really fast, you know, uh, lay down some quick times and ended up finished second overall. So uh, I was really excited about that, you know, and we, we got home and, you know, I was telling, telling somebody that, you know, I had a week off. Michael calls me in the next Monday. He's like, all right, we got a month to Spielberg, our next race. Let's go back to work. So everybody in my family flies, but also everybody in my family except me is a doctor. So. I'm doing the full-time air show, full-time Red Bull air race thing. And, you know, this has been my dream since I was three years old, to, to fly air shows, to fly aerobatics, to compete at a world level, to fly Red Bull air race. So I literally get to live my dream every single day. And, you know, Melissa, Mike Goulian, who is his mentor, uh, and as we mentioned earlier, is an AOPA ambassador. And both Mike and Kevin are just really nice guys. You know, and I think it says a lot about the aviation community that those people who are just such tremendous competitors and so talented are also just really great people. Yeah, paying it forward is definitely the way to go and it's great to see that happening. Well, that does it for us this week. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you back here next Thursday for another edition of AOPA Live This Week.